Revelation chapter 13 features a vision of a grotesque beast rising out of the sea with seven heads and ten horns. The mystery surrounding this beast has confounded theologians for centuries. We will attempt to unravel this amazing mystery with some truly surprising results on this week's episode of Revelation Unveiled on Faith by Reason. Welcome to Faith by Reason. The website behind it all is faithbyreason.net. There you will find hundreds of hours of study material, blogs, podcasts, and video. And I know that I desperately, desperately need to update the website. I just haven't had time to do so, but I promise I will get to it. And in the meantime, you will find all the latest stuff on the YouTube channel that you are probably currently watching right now. And of course, we are continuing our study of the book of Revelation, and we are on chapter 13, we are discussing the Antichrist, and we are finally ready to break down the verses of chapter 13 after spending a few episodes doing some introductory and background material on this fascinating, fascinating entity called the Antichrist. And now we are ready to start studying what's going on with this creature, this beast that rises out of the sea that, as I said before, has just been an amazingly mysterious figure. His identity is a puzzle full of symbology, so I, I can promise you that this episode is going to be a doozy. You will probably need to get some uh, paper and pen, or if you're more technologically inclined, you'll have your, your laptop or your pad ready to write down some notes because we are going to be going through a lot of material. We're going to be doing a lot of puzzle solving, a lot of connecting the dots throughout the Bible um, with some material that you may not have heard before because... Yeah, as I said, this is an extremely, extremely uh, mysterious puzzle. I anyway, mean, we're going to unravel it. I think we're going to we're going to get through that this episode. So buckle up, get your thinking caps on, and let's just start by reading the uh, first few verses of Revelation chapter thirteen. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on its horns and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had the feet of, like those of a bear, and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast its power and its throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but, that, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? The beast was the beast was giving a mouth given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies, and to exercise its authority for forty two months. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them, and it was given authority over every tribe, people, nation, and excuse me, language and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Okay, and that is all of Revelation 13 that we're going to cover in this session. And there's a lot happening here. And again, it's going to take, it's going to be quite a journey to understand what's happening. But before we start breaking down uh, this chapter, these, these verses, let's, let's, let's back up and give you some context. So Revelation 13 is actually a continuation of the vision that, John, that the Apostle John saw in chapter 12. Remember that the chapter breaks from the Bible were inserted much later, hundreds of years later by men in order to make the Bible easier to read. It's not like John was saying, okay, I'm ending chapter 12 here. Now I'll start chapter th this chapter 13. That's not what he did. M men did those and they don't always put the chapter breaks in accurately. Ap chapters 12 and 13 are the same vision. They're the vision of all of history through the lens of God who, who inhabits eternity. So I'm not going to go through what, what happened in, in chapter 12. You can go back a few weeks to the episode where we, where we broke all that down. But in order to give you context, let's talk about what happened towards the end of, of chapter 12. You had at, Towards the end of chapter 12, you had Satan and his fallen angels cast out of heaven. Um, and, and I think we, we saw that occurring in, uh, in chapter 6 of Revelation with, the, with uh, the sixth seal and the stars, which represent angels falling from being cast down from heaven. So Satan and his angels have, have cast down the earth. It says that Satan is furious. Why? Because he knows his time is short. When he and his angels are cast down the earth, they're cast down in order to be judged, meaning his final judgment is coming. He knows he only has a few uh, years left, so it's time to enact his endgame. 
and he begins to persecute the woman who is clothed in the sun, who we know is Israel from our study of Revelation chapter 12. And uh, but Israel is protected. The woman is protected supernaturally for uh, three and a half years. And this, of course, will be the fight, the, uh, the second half of the tribulation. So here's where we're picking things up. We are as we start chapter 13, we are looking at the second half of the tribulation because where um, Satan is making war against the uh, against the woman Israel and all and all believers. So that's what it says at the end of chapter 13, of chapter 12. Excuse me. Satan goes off to make war against Israel and against all believers in in, in Christ. So that is what we're, what's happening here. Um, and I know it's this, we have to believe it's the second half because in the first half of the tribulation, he's actually not going to be on friendlier terms with Israel because he's presenting himself as a false Jesus, a false Messiah. He will confirm that covenant with them, with um, um, Israel, which I part and parcel of that I believe is rebuilding their temple. And the Jews will see him as a messianic figure. But when he starts to torment them, obviously, they won't think of him as messianic anymore. And so. Um, so it must be the second half of the tribulation. So that's where we are. Satan is executing his end game, and this beast is part of it. So what is this? What is this beast? Who is this beast? Who or what is it? And why is it depicted in the way it is, having seven heads and ten horns and crowns on its horns, and it having uh, the looks of a leopard and a bear and a lion? Crazy stuff here. But is in order to interpret this. We need to do what we what we'd like to do on faith by reason and, and that is let the bible interpret the bible and in order to do that we need to look at another passage a little later on in revelation that features what i believe strongly believe is this same beast depicted in a slightly different manner and that would be in revelation chapter 17 which i'm going to read some selected verses from that i'm not going to read the whole thing because we haven't gotten to that point in our verse by verse study, we will in a few episodes get to chapter 17. But there, but again, this beast again is featured. Uh, only it's slightly different. The, diff the main difference in, in the beast that, that we'll talk about um, as I read uh, Revelation chapter 17 is, is kind of the coloring of it. And the and and, and it's in, there's, in a different context. So it's the same beast in two different contexts. And some people might think that these are completely different beasts. I don't think so. I think they're the same beast, but again, different context. What are the contexts? Well, remember there are remember the supernatural point of view. We've talked supernatural worldview. We've talked about this many times, and that is that we live in a parallel world. There, there are two worlds simultaneously existing: the spiritual world and the physical world. We live in a physical world. We have a spirit that exists in the spiritual world, but we can't see the spiritual world. However, they exist and they impact each other greatly. So if you are going to truly understand the interpretation of these beasts as they are presented in Revelation chapters 13 and 17, you have to look at it from the, from the idea that there are spiritual aspects and physical aspects. That's the only way you're going to get it. If you think that these beasts are all physical, that they're a physical man called the Antichrist and physical kingdoms only, you're going to miss some things. It's going to be confusing. On the other hand, if you think it's all spiritual and allegorical and symbolic and you don't and you ignore the fact that this is physically happening, literally happening on the earth, you're going to miss it. The only way to truly interpret this is to combine all those two views into the supernatural worldview that this is everything is happening physically on the physical plane and on the spiritual plane. And you'll understand. Hopefully you'll, you'll get that more as we start describing what's happening. So um, and, I, and I believe that Revelation 13 is more of a physical description of world empires and the physical antichrist. And I believe that Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter 17 is more spiritual. And because when we get to Revelation 17, when we do a study on it, you will see this is really about the end of religion. So it's very spiritual, although there are some aspects that cross over. So uh, well, let me just read um, some, select chap some select verses from Revelation chapter 13. I'm going to read verse 3, um, then verse 8 through 13, and verse 15. Okay, verse 3. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. So again, this is, I believe this is the same beast. It has the same characteristics. We're going to skip down to verse 8 where the angel starts giving John an interpretation. The beast which you saw once, once was, now is not, and yet will come up out of the abyss and go into its destruction. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names are not written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast, because it once was, 
now is not, and yet will come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills, or mountains, on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. The beast who once was, and now is not, is an eighth king. He belongs, or is of, the seven, and is going to his destruction. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They will have one purpose, and will give their power and authority to the beast. Down of uh, verse 15. And the angel said to me, The waters you saw where the woman, prostitute, sits, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. Okay, so that segment adds a lot of color to this description of the beast, but it also makes it even more complex. Uh, so what do we do with it? How do we break all this down? Well, the best way to do it is just let's just start listing out some of these characteristics and looking at the interpretations of them in order to get a full picture of what, who and what this beast out of the sea is. So again, there are, are going to be many dual spiritual and physical characteristics. I will try to let you know where it's more of the spiritual beast versus the physical beast, where, there, where it's a, a physical uh, empire or physical person versus a spiritual representation of fallen angels and demons and Nephilim and all that. So let's start with the sea or the waters. The beast rises out of the sea. Uh, and it also says that the beast sits on waters. And it says in, in chapter 17 that these waters physically are people and nations. So now we're talking about, about the physical. So this beast is, uh, is coming out of nations and waters. So this means that it's going to be a, a human being or, a, or at least a physical uh, manifestation of what's been going on in the nations with, pe with peoples and nations for, for a long time. We're going to find this, this beast uh, uh, encapsulates uh, all of, of man's physical, man's government, human government for all time. So that's the physical. The other aspect of the sea is that th the sea in the Bible is often seen as a source of, or an embodiment of chaos. The the sea is, was is an area where you know man can't conquer the sea. I mean it's it's two thirds of the earth. It's you know deep. We can't live in it. It's very dangerous to us. And so it's always the embodiment of chaos. It's also where demonic entities have been imprisoned. Waters are have always been symbolic of where um, angelic beings, fallen ang angelic beings, and uh, demonic entities, which are the spirit of Nephilim, have been imprisoned. So it's a, it's a chaos and it's an imprisonment for demonic entities. It's also the abyss, the the abyss or the abuso or the bottomless pit is also um, often associated with the sea because, again, that's where these demonic entities are imprisoned. And if you remember at the fifth trumpet, the angel of the bottomless pit is given a key and opens the bottomless pit and allows the entities that have been imprisoned in the bottomless pit to come out. So stick a pin in that. We're going to get back to that. So that, that's what the water is. This beast is coming out of the bottomless pit, meaning it's a demonic entity. And it's also the culmination of what's been going on with people as peoples and nations and governments uh, for since the very beginning. Okay, so that's the waters. Let's look at this beast itself. And again, as we, as, as we said before, it's physical and it's spiritual. So on the physical side, we see that this beast has the characteristics of three animals, a lion, a bear, and a leopard as its body. So the body is obviously the main part of this beast. Now, now this interpretation is actually pretty easy because we've seen it before. When we did the episode on the trial of the ages, we looked at Daniel chapter seven. And in Daniel chapter seven, we see a vision where Daniel saw these four beasts rising up out of the sea again. So this is obviously a callback to that same to the same beast rising up out of the sea. And Daniel saw this you know, vision a couple thousand years, or like 1,500 years before uh, John's vision. But we saw a beast that was a lion. We saw another beast that was a bear and another beast that was, a, that was a leopard. And they represented the Babylonian Empire under Nebuchadnezzar, the Medo-Persian Empire after that, and then the Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great after that. So it is pretty clear, pretty obvious that this beast that had a mouth of a lion, the body of a leopard, and the feet of a bear represents those empires. Now, why is that important as the body of the beast? 
And what does it tell us? Well, one thing it tells us is that the body of the beast, the main part of the beast is going to is going to encompass what these empires were. And what's important is that these empires embodied all of the um, current culture, religion and science that we enjoy at this moment. Uh, Babylon and Medo-Persia and Greece encompass all the religion, the science and the culture and philosophy of the modern world. All of our modern religion, and by that I mean I don't mean Christianity, I mean all the other the other types of religions, the false religions, the current science and the current culture and philosophy are all come from those empires. Uh, Babylon is where we get the a lot of the false religions. You can you can trace Islam back to this. You can trace Hinduism back to it. You can trace a lot of our, you know, the, the so-called spirituality, the paganism. All back to Babylon. Our science comes from Babylon, from Medo Persia. That's where we, we get our, our numbering system, our science, our astronomy, even as astrology, um, our geometry. You can all you can trace all that back to the Medo Persian Empire as well as Greece. In Greece, we get our our modern medicine. Again, more more modern um, uh, mathematics from Pythagoras and people like that. And of course, we have culture, philosophy, and government from Greece. Many of our current government, most of our uh, modern governments have their basis in the Greek system of government, parliamentary government, representative government. All that comes from Greece. Our culture, our philosophy, Aristotle, Socrates, uh, Plato, they are the ones who, who, those are the people who basically gave us the basis for all of our thinking and logic to this day. We still study them in college. I studied them in, in, in college. You probably did as well. So all of Western thought comes from these three empires, which tells us that the, this beast is going to be, is going to come out of that Western system. And that's what we have today. And I believe we're not too far from these end times. And, and so the body of this beast of this world system of this world government of this world leader is going to encompass those things because the Western style of government philosophy and science dominates the world. I mean, even though, if you, even if you look at the fact that China is a very dominant world power, well, let's be honest, China is propped up by the West. If it wasn't for the West, the Europe, the United States, uh, giving their technology to China, having these trade relations, relationships with China, China would be nothing. China was a, a borderline third world country uh, before World War II. After World War II, the West propped up China. So don't think that China is its own thing. When you get down to it, China is really run by the same people who run the entire world. And we've talked about them before. I have their, their little pictures on the screen. The people who run the world are Western. So don't be fooled by the fact that China is you know, raising up as a world power. Behind the scenes, they are controlled by the same people who control the rest of the world. These Satanists, these Luciferians who control the world. And they're all Western based or all European based. So that's that's the body of the beast. Interestingly, so those are the first, the first three beasts of so the lion, the bear and the leopard. But then you also have uh, uh, Daniel talking about this other beast that he was indescribable, which is great and terrible beast, which which will be the next empire that came along, which was Rome. And as I said in that episode about the trial of the ages, the Roman Empire may have ended as a physical empire around the third or fourth century. It still continued on in the form of Roman Catholicism, which is just basically it's, it's the same empire. It's just a theocracy instead of a uh, a senatorial monarchy, which what which is what Rome was before, it just continued on in the same way, just under the guise of Catholicism, where the Pope is the is the same as the Caesars of Rome. I'm not going to get into that. You can go back to that episode and and and, and look at it. So the the Roman power, this final this um third excuse me this fourth beast, is the same as it, it, again it's, it's had, it has the same power and it's had it for over about two thousand years, but this beast is said to have Ten horns. This fourth beast, the great and terrible beast in, in um, Daniel chapter seven, has ten horns, which again relates it to the heads that we're about to talk about. So I think it's very possible that the great and terrible beast that John, excuse me, <laughs> that Daniel saw in Daniel chapter seven, that represented the the Roman Empire and Catholicism, is this same beast, this same indescribable beast. So now that means we should get on to the seven heads. Uh, and before we get to that, just remember that the seven horns, horns are authority. Horns in the Bible represent authority. The 
you know, Jesus is, is seen as having seven, as having a, a, as being a lamb with seven horns in, uh, in Revelation chapters four and five, which we already talked about. And this, and Satan, the dragon also has horns, has, he has 10 horns on his head. This beast has 10 horns. Horns represent spiritual authority. So let's just make that clear. And there, there were crowns on the horns, as which we see in the, in the actual verses that we just talked about. All right, so let's look at the seven heads and what they and what they represent. Chapter 17 says that these seven heads are seven mountains and seven kings. What does that mean? Well, physical and spiritual. The seven mountains or hills, depending on your translation, are uh, are physical. Hills and mountains represent the seats of spiritual authority. They are seats of authority. Uh, uh, the authority of God is on the mountain of God, Mount Zion. We, we read about that through the Bible. There's also other mountains that have other spiritual authority, such as Mount Hermon in the area of Bashan. That's where the fallen angels of Genesis chapter six came down um, and procreated with women. We also see that uh, vividly described in the book of Enoch. The, uh, in Babel, man was attempting to create their own mountain their own seat of authority through the Tower of Babel, where, in which they wanted to have spiritual authority. So mountains are areas of, uh, of actual authority. And act, another way of saying the mountains are empires. Empires are seats of authority. So the seven heads are seven empires. And there are also seven kings. Now, these kings are not necessarily physical human kings. I don't believe they are at all. In fact, when the Bible speaks of, of kings in, in this context, they are speaking of spiritual beings. You have, for example, in uh, the book of Isaiah 14, which is one of the famous chapters that describes Satan's fall, it, 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 starts, talk, it starts off talking about someone called the uh, prince of, of, of Tyre, who is a human being. Human beings are usually princes that have spiritual authority. And then it turns, it, it turns to a, a, a prophecy against the king of Tyre. And the king of Tyre is spoken of in spiritual terms. That is Satan. You know, he has the five I wills. I will ascend to the top of the mountain. I will be like the most high, so forth and so on. That's clearly Satan. We see the same thing in Ezekiel chapter 28, which is also talking about the fall of Satan. And it begins talking about the prince of Babylon, a human prince, probably Nebuchadnezzar. And then it goes on to talk about the king of Babylon, which again is Satan, because it says you were in, you were in Eden, the garden of God, and you had all these precious stones that you're covering, and then you fell. This obviously is not Nebuchadnezzar. He wasn't in Eden. Satan was the Nakash, the serpent of old. So these kings are spiritual authorities. So again, the seven heads are seven mountains, seven empires, and seven spiritual authorities. Who are these seven? What are these seven mountains? They would be the seven world empires that have already existed. So which one of these set, which, who are these set, or who or what are these seven empires? So let's look at the seven empires that have ruled the world since the beginning. The very first empire was Babel in Genesis chapters uh, 10 and 11. Nimrod started the empire of Babel. It was the most successful world empire to date. Everyone was of one mind and he was in, and of one thought and one purpose. And their purpose was again, to build their own mountain their own tower to reach to heaven. Now, because heaven's in the sky, they were they were making a a mountain to reach into the realm of heavens. They were trying to make a portal, a gateway into heavens. They were, they were going to invade heaven. And that's going to be important when we get to Armageddon because that's the real purpose of Armageddon. Not because they want to shoot bullets and, and, and bow and arrow at God. No, they're trying to invade heaven by making another portal to heaven. And it will be done again by Nimrod. And I'm going to tell you what that means in a few minutes. But that was Babel. And again, it was it was the most complete empire, and every other empire since Babel has been inferior to it because it's never you've never had the complete control, the complete purpose, and the, the that that perfect, in in a in a secular um, sinful sense, that perfect perfect purpose of, of all men united. The next empire on the scene was Egypt. We see that in the time of Abraham. Abraham lived actually during the lifetime of Nimrod. So the second, and and we and we see that that Abraham interacted with. Egypt, and of course, later on in Genesis, Egypt was the world power where, you know, Joseph and um, his brothers had their interactions there. So the second world empire was Egypt. The third world empire was Babylon. Some people say it was Assyria. Um, Assyria was before Babylon, but they were not a world empire. They didn't rule the world. Uh, Babel ruled the world. Egypt ruled the known world. 
Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar was the second, was, was the third empire to rule the world. And we, you know, of course, we see that in, in the book of Daniel, which we just talked about. After that, you had the Medo-Persian Medo -Persian Empire. They ruled the known world. After that, you had the Empire of Greece, and we're in familiar territory here. Then we had the Empire of Rome, which again started um, about, about the second century BC and continues to this day in the form of Catholicism. The Catholic Church rules the world in, in you know, in, in, in in very distinct and direct and indirect ways, there is no other authority that is more powerful in the world than that church. It reaches all over the world, even into secular spaces. And we talked about that in the trial of the ages episode. You can go back there and, and get more information. So that's, that's the sixth and the seventh empire is upcoming. That will be the empire of the antichrist that he establishes after Satan's false apocalypse of revelation chapter six, and where he, he sets himself up as the ruler of the world. And of course, that's what we're talking about now. The, the Satan gives his, his, his beast, his antichrist, all his authority. So those are the seven empires, the seven mountains that represent the seven heads of, of this beast. And, and further proof that these are all the seven empires is, is the description. It says that uh, in uh, chapter 17, that of, the, of these heads, five have fallen, one is, and one is yet to come, and he will, and when that, and when uh, that uh, king of that empire comes, it will continue for a short time. So, at the time of John, five of these empires had fallen. At the time of John, in the first century, Babel had fallen, Egypt had fallen, Babylon had fallen, Medo Persian, Medo Persia had fallen, and so had Greece. So, those are the five that had fallen. One is what was the empire during John's time? Rome, obviously. He was in Rome, so that's that one is, and one is to come, and that will be the empire of the Antichrist. So I think that's further proof of, of what, of who, and what these uh, seven heads, these seven mountains, these seven empires were. And you'll find many Bible teachers who are in agreement on this to some degree. Uh, you know, there's some controversy here and there, but um, what I'm what I've been saying so far is not completely out of line with uh, what. You will find when you read the commentaries of other theologians. Now, here's where it gets pretty weird, because here is a huge puzzle. In in chapter 17, it says the beast was, is not, and yet is. He was, he currently is not, yet he is, and he is to come. What in the world does that mean? Furthermore, it also says that of the seven heads, there that this beast. This final beast is the eighth and is of the seven and goes into perdition. What in the world does that mean? How can this beast be, how can he be, was, is not, yet is, and is to come. And he's also the eighth and is of the seven. That is a huge puzzle that I've never seen adequately dealt with. Honestly, a lot of the commentators kind of gloss over this a bit. They don't spend too much time on it because it's just, it's, it's, it, it seems to make, it's, to make no sense. It seems to be illogical, but it's only illogical if you don't have the supernatural worldview. If you don't realize that this beast and this beast system is not only physical, but also spiritual. So how does this work? How do we interpret this? Okay, let's start at, by looking at this beast being the eighth and of the seventh. Again, verse 11 of chapter 17, the beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven or is of the seven and it's going to the destruction. So this, the beast is also an eighth king. He, he belongs to the seven. He's going into, in, into destruction. So how, how do we parse that out? So the beast itself is the eighth king. It's not the eighth head. The, the, the beast has seven heads. John does not dispute that. It doesn't say the beast has eight heads. Some people have tried to say, well, there's an eighth head that John didn't mention. No, no, no. He clearly says his beast has seven heads. It doesn't have eight. So it's not an eighth head. The eighth is the beast itself. The beast is itself an eighth king that is on par with the seventh, but he is the entire beast. How does that work? Well, let's keep diving deeper. It says he belongs to the seven or is of the seven. Well, let's look at that word of, because remember, the Bible was not written in English. It was translated. So the word of or belongs to is actually the English translation of a Greek word. And the Greek word could also mean that word of or belongs to could mean the source of or the result of. So this eighth king is the source of the other seven or 
the result of the other seven. Which is it? I actually think it's both. I think this eighth is the source of the other seven and the result of the other seven. Remember, multiple resolutions. We talked about this. Go to faithbyreason.net. Uh, look at the multiple resolutions um, uh, category. How is he? Who is who is the source? He's a king. So we, he, this is a person, a physical, a, a personal entity. Who is the source of the seven? What are the seven? The seven are all world empires. Who is the source of all world empires? Well, the source of all world empires would have to be the first, right? The first king, the very first, the one, because every world empire would, would be a model of that. Who is that? I believe it's our old pal Nimrod. Nimrod was the first world dictator. He started Babel. We read about him in Genesis chapters uh, 10 and 11. It says Nimrod began to be a mighty one, a Giborim. We'll talk about that in a second. And he gathered the first world empires, became a mighty one in the earth. And he gathered this empire and he created Babel. Every empire since Nimrod has been trying to emulate Babel because Babel was the most complete and perfect empire ever. It was the people were one mind. They were perfectly governed. Every empire since uh, Babylon, Egypt, Greece, Medo-Persia, Rome, look, look, look at Hitler, look at Stalin, look at Mao, look at uh, Attila the Hun, look at all the different empires, the, the Holy Roman empires. They've all been trying to do the same thing, perfectly govern a world empire, and they've all been less. They've all been trying to emulate Babel. The source of the seven empires is Nimrod. Nimrod is the eighth. Furthermore, what else do we know about Nimrod? We know, as I just said before, he began to become a Giborim, a mighty one. What is a Giborim? That is one of the titles of the Nephilim, a mighty one, a mighty man. They were called Gibor in Genesis chapter 6, when, again, the, the angels, the Benai the Elohim, came down to earth, and they had intercourse with women, and they produced these um, these hybrids, and it says in Genesis chapter, chapter 6, these were the mighty men of old, the Giborim of old. Now, yes, I know that that term mighty men or Gibor is used elsewhere in the Bible. Uh, the King David was taught, he was told that we were told that he had his mighty men, his Gibor. However, let's keep context in mind that Moses wrote chapter 6 of Genesis, and he also wrote chapter 10 and 11 of Genesis. They're right next to each other. And in chapter 6, Giborim are Nephilim. So it makes sense to believe that in context that the same term, Gibor, a few chapters later, means the same thing, Nephilim. Nimrod became a Nephilim. He said he began to become a Giborim somehow through some type of genetic manipulation with the uh, with fallen angels. He became a Nephilim. That's going to make more sense and, and be more poignant in the next two episodes when, when we talk about the Antichrist and how he comes back to life after his deadly wound and the mark of the beast, because that, I believe that that's going, that's going to be part and parcel of making humanity be like Nimrod. So Nimrod becomes a, a, a Giborim, he becomes a Nephilim. What is a Nephilim? A Nephilim is a human spiritual hybrid. Nimrod was somehow altered in a way to make him something other than human. He was a human angelic or human spiritual hybrid. So Nimrod eventually dies. He was actually killed according to historical legend. What happened when he when he died? Well, he is not a human being fully anymore, being a, a Giborim, being a Nephilim. So he does not uh, go to Sheol or to heaven as a human would. He is actually imprisoned like the other Nephilim. He has the same fate as the other Nephilim. They are bound in the abyss, the abuso, the bottomless pit, the waters. What, remember what we just talked about. The waters, the seas, are where Nephilim, spiritual evil, are, um, are imprisoned. Nimrod was imprisoned there with like all the other Nephilim in the bottomless pit, in the abyss, in the abuso. So Nimrod was... He existed in the past. He exists. Now, he is not. He is currently not in the physical world, but he still exists. Why? Because he's in the bottomless pit. He exists right now. At this moment, Nimrod exists in the bottomless pit, but he is not physical. So he was and he is not. His spirit is bound. Yet he is, he exists, and he is to come. How do we know he is to come? Because in Revelation chapters 
eight and nine, or specifically chapter nine, an angel from the bottom, an angel of the bottomless pit is given a key and he opens the bottomless pit. And what comes out? The Nephilim. We talked about this during our series on the seven trumpets. When the fifth trumpet is blown, the bottomless pit is open and all of that spiritual evil is allowed to come out in, in, in most cases as these uh, demonic locusts who torment men for five months, which is the five, which represents the five months that the flood was on the earth, which killed all the Nephilim. So they are getting their revenge on mankind for the five months that they were killed in the flood. But Nimrod would have been, would have been allowed, his spirit would have been allowed loose then. So he was, he is not currently, but he is to come when the bottomless pit is open and all the demonic entities are allowed out and onto the earth so that they can be judged. That's who this is. He is the eighth and he is the source of the seven. He, he is the eighth empire. He is the eighth king and he is the source of the, of the other seven. And as we'll see in a moment, he is also the result. He is the ultimate expression, the final expression of these seven. And remember again that here in, in, in chapter 17, verse, uh, verse 8, it says, The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and yet will come out of the abyss, out of the bottomless pit, and go into destruction. So I think this is clear that this final beast who was, is not, and is, will come out of the abyss, out of the abyss, meaning he is a Nephilim who was bound there and he comes out and folks is Nimrod. Nimrod is the only one who, who meets this description. He is the only one who is the source of these seven empires. He is the only one who was bound in the bottomless pit and he will be released and he will come out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, which is destruction. That's, that's his ultimate fate, his ultimate, the ultimate prophetic fate of Nimrod. Okay, before we bring this all together, let's look at the, at the last aspect of it and that is the... The, uh, the, the, the ten horns. Verse 12 of chapter 17 says, The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not received a kingdom, but who will, in one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. Okay, so we saw these ten horns back in Daniel chapter 7 on that on the uh, on the fourth beast. Who are they? Exactly, I, I don't know who they exactly are, but I do know that they are ten spiritual authorities. Um, you, maybe they, they probably have names. The Bible doesn't name exactly who they are, but it says that they, again, they, they have this authority and they, they, but they will be given special authority along with the beast for an hour. So, but they've existed before. They've existed during the, since the time of the Roman empire. Maybe they were the spiritual entities that were guiding the Roman empire through its inception, all the way through its fall its physical fall through the its conversion to the Catholic Church all the way up until now, but they haven't had complete power over the world. They've had authority, but not complete authority. However, it says here that when the Antichrist comes, they will give their authority back to him for a short time, you know, basically about three and a half years, which is you know considering all of human history by an, an hour, a very short amount of time. They will give their authority to the beast, so the beast will have total authority. All right, let's bring this all together and, and talk about how this is all going to work. How does this all come together? As we talked about in, this, in the previous episode, when the Antichrist first comes onto the scene, he's going to have all the answers. He is going to have all the answers to the false apocalypse that Satan starts. And then he's going to be re re revealed, re excuse me, revered as this world leader with a plan. He's going to just be well thought of. He's going to be a great speaker, very charming. People are going to love him. He's going to be the world leader. And then he's going to confirm that covenant with Israel for seven years, which starts the period of time called the tribulation. During As that happens, God is going to blow the seven. He's going to have the seven trumpets blown, which is going to cause devastation on the earth, including the opening of the bottomless pit where Nimrod will come out. Nimrod will not be the Antichrist at this moment. He will just be a spirit, an entity that is, is brought onto the earth with all the other Nephilim, Nephilim spirits they have released in order to wreak havoc and be brought to earth for judgment. Then you're going to have the two witnesses and they are going to be preaching against the, the Antichrist for, for, the, for the first three and a half years of the tribulation. And we saw in Revelation chapter 11, which we went over, at some point, the, the, um, the two witnesses are going to be killed by the Antichrist. But at that time, the, the Antichrist is called the beast out of the, out of the bottomless pit. 
I believe that's Nimrod. So I believe that right before the three and a half year point, maybe even a few days or a few hours before that happens, the Antichrist is going to suffer that wounded head. We see in chapter 13, uh, verse 3, that one of the heads, one of the seven heads, had, suffers a fatal wound. And of course, I believe that's the seventh head suffers a fatal wound. But you could also argue that it could also be the first head. It could be the first head or the seventh head, and maybe, you know, maybe a little bit of both. It suffers a fatal wound because the first head is Babylon. Babylon has suffered a fatal wound. Babylon was wounded. I'm sorry, Babel. Excuse me, Babel, the first head. Babel was wounded, but it never died. Why? Because the spirit of Babel has existed as it's gone through all the other empires. Every empire since Babel has tried to be like Babel, but it's never fully uh, been, uh, it's never fully, they've never fully reached the glory and the singleness of purpose that Babel did. So Babel has been wounded and it's never fully come back. But it could also be physically that seventh empire, that seventh king, which is the Antichrist himself during the first three and a half years. So at some point, he su suffers a mortal head wound. And I believe it's spiritual and physical. The, I think the, the, the physical, I mean, the, the, the spiritual wound is the wound to the kingdom of Babel, which again has never come back fully, although it's been wounded. And physically, it is the Antichrist. The human being is going to be fatally wounded. Maybe it's an assassination attempt or something like that. But he... It looks like he suffers a fatal wound, but he comes back. He feigns a resurrection. And this this is in line with him positioning himself as a false Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was executed, but came back to life. So similarly, the man who is the Antichrist will be executed. Again, probably an assassination attempt, and he will come back to life. But it will not be a resurrection. Why? Because Satan does not have the power of life. And we're going to get into the mechanics of how he comes back to life in the next episode when we talk about the false prophet. But it will not be a resurrection like Jesus. Jesus' life was given back to him because he didn't deserve to die. Justice stated that since he didn't deserve to die, the only man who ever walked the earth who didn't deserve to die was Jesus because he never sinned. So by justice, God had to give him back his life. And he had to give him back infinite life, which is how he could save all of us because he has infinite life. He can give it out to infinite number of people. So that's why we are able to have the life of Jesus, that eternal life in our souls. So, and I'm getting a little off topic here. But Satan does not have that ability. Satan does not have the power of life at all. Yet somehow this body of the Antichrist does come back to life, but his spirit is not there. The Antichrist, the human being who is the Antichrist, is like any other man. When he dies, his spirit is separated from his body. It does not come back. The spirit of the man who's the Antichrist is gone. However, his body is reanimated with a different spirit. When the Antichrist is killed, his body is now inhabited, possessed by the spirit of a Nephilim. Because remember, the Nephilim are demons. Demons cannot manifest. Remember, demons are always trying to possess people. You see, during the time of Jesus, he has to cast demons out of people because demons want to be embodied. Fallen angels can create bodies for themselves. That's how they were able to have intercourse with women. That's how they're able to appear physically in front of people. However, demons cannot. Demons are the disembodied spirit, spirits of the Nephilim, and they need to be embodied. Nimrod is a Nephilim. He is a disembodied spirit. He will be embodied in this Antichrist. He is the eighth and of the seventh and goes into perdition. He is the beast. He is the eighth. He is the body of the beast of the seven. He will he will enter into this body of the Antichrist. He will animate it. And now he will be the beast out of the bottomless pit who the first thing he does, he will make war against the two witnesses. He will overcome them. And then he will do what he's always done. He will commit. He will want to be worshipped. He will commit the abomination of desolation. That is when he goes into the temple and declares himself to be God. Paul says himself, and I'll have the verse on the screen, that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. So this is what the Antichrist does. I'm sorry, this is what Nimrod does when he embodies the Antichrist. This at three and a half year point, when the woman is in the wilderness, Satan knows his time is short, which we, which we talked about in Revelation chapter 12. He sits, he's on the sand of the sea. This beast comes out of the sea, out of the abyss, having seven heads and ten horns and those ten crowns. That is Nimrod. Nimrod is this beast that rises up out of the sea. He is part of Satan's endgame. Satan knows his time is short. His, his Antichrist figure has just been killed. 
He's like, okay, it's time to it's time to just it's time to bring this all to a close. We need to get rid of Israel. I want to be worshipped as God. I want my true Antichrist on the throne. He stands on the Satan, the dragon is on the sands of the sea. Nimrod comes out of the abyss, being this beast that is the beginning of the all, all the world empires. He inhabits the body of the Antichrist. He kills the two witnesses. He goes into the, the new Jewish temple. He stands in the in the Holy of Holies and says, I am God. He demands to be worshipped. He demands that Satan be worshipped and they will be. It says right in here in chapter 13 that people will worship the dragon who gave the authority to the beast and they will worship the beast saying who is like this beast and who is able to make war with him. Why do they say that part? We'll talk about that in the next episode. Why do people believe that this beast is so amazing and incredible that no one could ever make war with him? Again, next week, I'm sorry, next episode, hopefully it's next week. Next episode, we'll get into that and I'll tell you exactly why, how he comes back to life shows that it is impossible to make war with him and it's impossible to be like him or that it's very difficult and people will want to be like him, but, but no one will be able to make war with him. He is inhabiting the Antichrist. There are those who say that the Antichrist will be indwelt by Satan. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible does not say that he will be indwelled by Satan. That's that's a Christian tradition. The Bible says the opposite, actually. The, the Bible speaks of the Antichrist, the Sa Satan, and the false prophet as three different entities. They are not one and the same. They are three completely different entities. The dragon is on his own. He's one entity that's worshipped. The Antichrist is another. And the false prophet is yet a third. So he will not be indwelled by Satan. I believe he will be indwelled by Nimrod, by this beast. And looking again at chapter 13, we're talking about the physical beast here. He'll be given again a mouth uttering proud words and blasphemies, and he will exercise his authority for 42 months, the three, three and a half years. So the last three and a half years, he will be possessed by Nimrod. He will rule the world. He will open his, he will blaspheme God. He will slander his name. He will slander the people who dwell in heaven. Who's that? That's Christians. That's us. Hopefully, if you are part of the first rapture, you will be there and actually the second too, because the second rapture happens at the, at the midpoint. So everyone who dwells in heaven will be blasphemed by the Antichrist, by this, by the Antichrist that's possessed by Nimrod. By the way, if you want, if that confuses you, you don't understand about the, the, there are three raptures at the end of time, not just one. You don't have to pick pre, mid or post trip. Actually, all three are, are correct in their own way. I won't get into that now. I have to do a whole series on the rapture. I have a blog, podcast, videos, everything you want to know about the rapture. Just go to the faithbyreason.net. Look at the category of the rapture and, and you have all the information you ever want to know about the rapture and why most people have it completely wrong. And the Bible is right and man is wrong on that. Um, and everyone will worship this beast. All the inhabitants of the earth will worship him because he will demand to be worshipped. And, um, and by all the world, it says clearly all those who are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, all those who are not saved. So if there are any people who come to salvation at this midpoint of the tribulation, they will be the ones who will not worship the Antichrist and they will unfortunately have a very, very difficult time. And we'll talk more about that, their difficult time in the next episode. But yeah, but but that's it. That's pretty much it because we're, we're at 48 minute mark. So I've gone overboard, but over time, rather, probably overboard and over time. But I think this is very important to understand the mystery of this beast. So, again, to summarize, the beast that comes out of the sea, out of the abyss, with is Nimrod. This beast is described as encompassing all the empires of the world and specifically the influence of the last four empires, which are the empires that have shaped the Western world. And, of course, the Western world rules the entire world. And Nimrod has been the is the source of all of those empires. He is the spiritual source of every world empire. No one has done it as well as Nimrod did. Um, and he is going to come out of the Abuso because he is a Nephilim. The Nephilim were, were bound in the abyss in the bottomless pit. He will be let out of the bottomless pit. He is called the beast from the bottomless pit. He is also known as the Antichrist here. He It is said very clearly that there will be a head wound. He will come back from the head wound. And at that time, he will no longer be a man. He will be a beast. This beast is Nimrod. The Antichrist is Nimrod 2.0. He will be possessed and inhabited from during the last three and a half years. And that's when he goes from being the charming leader to being the king of fierce countenance, the angry king. Because you figure... Uh, Nimrod having been in prison for the better part of 4,000 years, when he gets out, he's probably going to be a little bit cranky. 
he probably won't be the most pleasant person. I mean, I've never been in prison for 4,000 years, but I'm, I'm guessing if I was, I would not have the best attitude. So <laughs> Nimrod will come out. He will, he, will, he will be pretty salty, pretty surly, and he will want what he had before when he was on earth to be worshipped and to rule the world and to blaspheme God. And that is exactly what he will do. That is why he is this beast. Okay, let's talk about the next episode. In the next episode, we're going to talk about the third member of this unholy trinity. We know the dragon. We know the beast from the sea. We're going to talk about the beast of the earth, who is also called the false prophet. We'll talk about his career, who he probably, who he might be, not specifically, but um, at least in a, a rep representative um, aspect. And we will get into exactly how he facilitates the resurrection, the quote unquote resurrection of the Antichrist. And I'll give you a hint. If you notice, if you read all of chapter 13, you will see that it says that the uh, false prophet tells people to worship the image of the beast. An image of the Antichrist is made. And people are told to worship the image. Why are people told to worship this image and not necessarily the Antichrist himself, at least in the second half of the tribulation? That is a key to understanding how he comes back is that at, when he comes back, people are no longer worshiping the Antichrist. They're worshiping this image. So what is the image of the beast? Is it just a statue that walks and talks or is it something more? Well, I'm going to tell you something more. And if you thought this episode was was kind of crazy and um, all the all the theoretical stuff that's happening. Well, you ain't, you ain't seen nothing yet. The next two episodes, when we talk about the false prophet, and after that, when we talk about the mark of the beast. Oh, it's going to get really, really intense. So, thank you for listening and watching. I appreciate it. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel by hitting the subscribe button and hitting the notification bell and liking and sharing and just hit every possible button you can. Also, subscribe to faithbyreason.net by putting your uh, email into that right navigation area on faithbyreason.net and I promise I will update the site as soon as I can and until next time again thanks for watching and next time we'll talk about the false prophet <laughs>